So, what I want to do today is basically just continue the discussion on um, on angular momentum operators and then just move on directly to the hydrogen atom right. So, I just want to finish the discussion last time that I could not that I could not get done. So, what I wanted you to consider was basically the following I said consider uh, a vector x basically being transported a little bit by um, by the operator p right. And so, the way it, it you know it will be transported is basically I wanted to move to x plus um, delta which is e to the i p delta divided by h bar acting on x right. And so, this quantity we can basically refer to as T x of delta right T x uh, is basically tells you the direct the 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 direction along which the momentum operator is acting right. So, I should qualify because I am going to generalize this entire thing to three dimensions I should qualify that this is basically p along the x direction times delta over h bar right. So, this is just short this is just a, a, a complicated way of writing um, d by dx right that is all. So, there is nothing else to it. And so, now what I want to do is I want to consider basically a situation where I take something about the z axis and I simply rotate it right from there to there right. And uh, so, I have a vector r which is x y z going to a vector r prime which is x prime y prime z prime right. And uh, because the rotation is about the z axis z prime is z right. So, it is an x it is a two dimensional I am just doing this in two dimensions just to kind of get get the intuition going right. And immediately you can basically see that x prime basically you can write as r cosine of omega t plus omega delta t right. So, what I am assuming is there is a rotation which is happening with some frequency omega and at time t I am asking what is how is it moving from time t to time t plus delta right t plus delta t. So, it is the same if you think of omega delta t as a delta theta then it is the angular version of this question right that is all. Which of course, I can just basically do a Taylor series expansion. in a second right. So, what I what I want you to convince yourself of is that this is approximately basically x minus y omega delta t right and this is x omega delta t plus y right. So, imagine what this is it is just a two dimensional rotation x y minus y uh, x x minus y plus y right. It is a two dimensional rotation right uh, of a of a vector right and so that is that is the way that transformation would go right. You can you can just do Taylor C's expansion get get to the same answer as well. So, what I can write basically is I can write this x prime y prime z this vector I could write it as x minus y omega delta t or dt let me stick to my notation uh, y plus x omega delta t and z right. And that little uh, algebra is, is all that I need to actually make the point that I want to make which is I can write this as a transformation a translation along the x direction by an amount which is minus y omega delta t and a translation along the y direction by an amount which is x omega delta t acting on x y z right. 
So I'm building off of this translation matrix that I, you know, that I just wrote. I'm building off of that operator, right? And now it becomes very, very clear what um, what's going to happen because these operators don't commute, right? So you have to write, you have to figure out what to deal, what to do with them, and what you can do is basically write t x of minus y omega delta t t y of x omega delta t like let me make sure I have minus y omega delta t and f plus x omega delta t right. I can approximately write this as e to the minus i times y p x minus x p y times omega delta t over h bar right. So the point is there is second order so these operators do not commute right remember remember basically that y p x does not commute with x p y right yeah so there is a y p y and then x p x right. So um, so you could just check this right. right and this quantity you know technically I should move it over here but it doesn't matter um, right why I move out right and then I keep the y there and I move this one out sorry I'm doing it the other way around um, so I move the py to the right uh, px to the right and I move the x to the left right and so anyway the point is that there is a y p y here and an x p x there and those things are non right. So this commutator is non zero. So because of this commutator being non zero this statement is only true in the limit that delta t goes to zero right. In the limit that delta t goes to zero the only the first order terms are important and when the first and the first order terms are identically the same right. You can just check by expanding out both sides. So, what you can definitely write is that um, T x of minus y omega delta T, T y of x omega delta T in the limit the delta T going to 0 right is identically equal to e to the minus i L z times omega delta T over h bar right. So this omega delta t over h bar simply becomes some angle theta right, right theta over h bar right. So what it is basically saying is that is that if you expand out the first order you know terms and you know and in the limit that you basically are not uh, where you can ignore the second order terms this is what you can you can work out right. So it is a kind of what I the reason that I wanted to do this is basically because um, it tells you what actually the L x L y L z operators are doing they are rotating you about a given axis right. So is this clear to you because I started from the reverse procedure right you just have to work out this algebra but I started from the reverse procedure which is I said let me assume that I am actually making a rotation write out the rotation vectors and then just prove to you by just a couple of lines of algebra that in fact what you get is this L L y L z operator right rotation about the z axis. So you would be convinced that you know that if you did the other two as well you would be convinced essentially that a general rotation I can write now. So let me liberate not just x and y uh, let me not just do a rotation about x and y but let me do a general rotation. So I can make an x prime y prime z prime rotation I can basically make the statement that this would be I would be able to write this as e to the i l dot n right over h bar times some theta acting on x y z right. And so in the space of cats right what is happening is, is this l operator is actually performing a rotation right. 
it is performing a rotation in the space of cats. And what I will do basically um, in another 2 minutes is apply this sorry apply this basically this entire thing to uh, to actual states that we are interested in the angular momentum states that we are interested in and we will see how that rotation plays out right. So, that was what I wanted to say last last time. So, that is that is that discussion. What I want you to see is what is this actually doing? What this is doing is it is performing a general rotation. If you think of the three dimensional unit sphere right and what we are trying to do right here what I am implying is that there is a three dimensional vector, but just imagine that the length of this vector is always 1 because we are just doing rotations right. So, uh, if you have a three dimensional unit sphere then what we are saying is that a general rotation of this form can be achieved by basically the angular momentum vector right. The angular momentum vector actually performs this rotation right. So, rotations basically are generated by the angular momentum operator right just as just as we said translations are generated by the momentum operator right. And this sits well with our classical mechanical intuition of these objects as well right. So, the the classical quantum correspondence the statement that you know that that uh, I have given these operators this name actually sits well because we are actually even able to understand how the rotations come about. So, how the right how the classical mechanics moves into quantum mechanics right. So, um, now if you look at what uh, what happens L square the fact that it commutes with L what does it mean right. What it means is that if you move basically uh, if you try and rotate the L square operator right it does not move at all right it is completely invariant. Because how would you rotate it? You would rotate it as e to the i right. You would use this rotation matrix let us it is some unitary matrix let us call it v right. You would do something like v l square v dagger right. That is how you would rotate an object right v dagger l square v right. So, that is how you would rotate an operator right and the point is that it commutes right through because the l commutes right. And what that means is that the l square operator actually is invariant to what to rotations. Right. So, what is another way of saying this? It possesses rotational symmetry, right. So, it is it is what is called SO3 symmetry, right. So, it possesses this SO3 symmetry, right. And that is the understanding that we have of the of the rigid rotor, right. So, this is remember what this discussion was about last time. So, the rigid rotor, if you take this um, uh, L square to uh, over 2 mu i, right, is the Hamiltonian. So, if you take this then the eigenvalues right are basically L into L plus 1 h bar square over right um, E L right uh, 2i sorry right. If I take the uh, the rigid rotor which is L square over 2i then the eigenvalues are L into L plus but there is still this m quantum number right. The wave functions are the spherical harmonics and what that means is you have to understand or we we have to discuss together where this a m degeneracy is coming from and now you understand it comes from the fact that the L square operator does not care about rotations right. So, all the different rotational states that you can get right at a given value of L all the different m's produce the same energy. And another way of saying that saying it is that this Hamiltonian possesses rotational invariance. This Hamiltonian does not care about about rotations right. So, that is the that is the that is the story that I wanted to say last time we just ran out of time to do it right ok. So, what I am going to do is I want you to hang on to that intuition because what I am going to do is we are going to do the hydrogen atom and then you are going to see the m quantum number appear there as well and then we have to discuss what is happening to the m and what is happening to the l right. So, go ahead. It is, but these are ok. So, this is the business with generators right. So, uh, gen, uh, so what generators do is you can always think of their action as basically taking you from x to x plus delta x. They are kind of transformations that are that are in that limit. So, when you apply the exponential you can actually apply it with a finite angle, but actually what they are doing is they are they're, they're doing infinitesimal at every point they are taking you from x to x plus delta x right. So, this suffices right. So, even though I wrote the argument this way right this suffices right um, ok. So, uh, again as a preview right. So, what this means is that this thing has this L and M quantum number and this thing is you know the degeneracy of the energy eigenvalues to the M quantum number 
is related to rotational invariance, right? Now we understand, we understand this. I hope that we understand this now, right? Because we've actually gone through the full rotational uh, symmetry group and we've gone through this discussion, right? And so it should be very clear to you that this is in fact what is happening. Now the question is, in the hydrogen atom, as a preview again, I want to say this simply because, you know, it is lost on many a student. Um, you know, if you think about, if you contrast this with the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen atom has an NLM, right, and its energy, right, is this minus 13.6 by n squared, right, in electron volts, right. And so, this quantity, basically, the question is, what is actually happening with the L and the M degeneracies, right? That's the mystery that I, I want you to understand the problem because otherwise when I show you the solution, it makes no sense, right? You have to be thirsty before you drink, right? So, you, what I'm trying to get you to, un, get you to see is that the Kepler problem, right? This is completely the same story in classical mechanics as well. You should go look at your textbooks, right? Uh, the Kepler problem has this slightly weird weird thing about it, which kind of we hand wave and just forget about, right? Uh, which is that it only, not only has one degenerate um, quantum number, it has two. Right? And so what we are going to do is basically, uh, so when we did the rigid rotor, what we understood was rotations, right? And the role of rotations um, uh, you know the the generator of rotations, and we understood this uh, this uh, sim this you know this symmetry, the symmetry of uh, SO three rotations, and we hence understood why this degeneracy. Is. So we, you know we've explained why this degeneracy is, this M degeneracy. This M degeneracy comes basically because the uh, the L square operator commutes with the L operator, and the L operator generates basically rotations, right? And the L Z eigenvalue is this M. Which means that if you change, you know, if you apply an e to the lz, l square e to the minus lz, the lz eigenvalue basically uh, is reported, but for different values of lz, nothing happens, right? So if you take, sorry, if you take e to the, um, so this operator, sorry, v, right? So if you do something like v dagger l square v, what you're doing is you're changing, changing the m quantum number, right? But the m quantum number never shows up in the, in the physics, so only the l quantum number shows up, right? And because this object is equal to L squared, when you ask before rotation and after rotation, when you say what is your eigenvalue with respect to L square operator, it produces the answer, you know, L into L plus 1. When you ask before and after rotation what is your M quantum number, the M quantum number changes, right? So that's, you know, I'm just saying this out loud in, in words, right? Okay. So, um, so with that, what I want to do is, now that we are here, this is a slightly unusual place to do this. But in terms of algebra, it's only like five minutes of algebra. So I just want to show you a very nice uh, construction, which you will use in, uh, hopefully in quantum two and uh, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, I mean, if we start doing Wigner record, which I don't know. Um, if we start doing Wigner record, then, you know, then we'll start seeing this as well. And it's basically called the Wigner D matrix. It's a, it's a way of basically performing rotations of angular momentum states. Right, I'm making this vague statement here, so I just want to kind of do the math so that I just show you exactly how it works, right? So that you can just see, instead of me hand waving at you with this kind of a ket construction, um, let me actually just consider angular momentum states, rotate them and show you what happens, right? And then you can, you can basically rest assured that you can do the analysis and interpret the physics that comes out of it, right? So let me just start, so this discussion Right. So um, I wanted to look this up. I have forgotten to um, tell me. Somebody tell me if this uh, Wigner D matrix is in Shankar or not. I've forgotten to look this up. That's a prescribed textbook. And so if it is not in Shankar, I will just point at a reference to you. Uh, but can you just email me, class representative? <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Um, so what I wanted. Um, what I want to begin with is basically the following, um, right? So I've switched for no good reason. I've switched notation to uh, the uh, the eigenvalue j, but uh, you know I can I can leave it as l, right?
right. So, this is the orthogonality relationship right for the angular momentum state, the spherical harmonics. And the other thing, uh, the other orthogonality that we will use basically right. Now, the question is what is e to the i l dot n times phi acting on an l m state right. That is the question that I am really asking here. I am saying I want to take an operator expectation value. So, for instance, I have an l m and I want to take l square expectation value right or I want to take the expectation value is this the same I want to ask right. Right. Here we know the answer. So, what I am asking is I want to rotate this quantum state and I want to ask again whether the whether the L square quantum number is the same. Right. Here we know the answer because this thing just commutes right through. Right. But in general I want to know what the answer to this question is. Right. I want to know how to perform the state transformation because if instead of L square I have some other operator L plus let us say. Right. That does not commute with LZ. Right. Then indeed I have to know the, I have to know how to make the states so that I can calculate this expectation value, right. So that is the reason that I am, that I am actually just going to show you very quickly how to do mathematically just how to do this transformation. And it is about 4 lines again of algebra, sir, right. I mean these are all, um, right, uh, okay. So let me just call this state psi for now, right. And what I am going to do is, I am going to write psi is the identity times psi, which is the identity times e to the i l dot n phi times l m which I insert an l prime m prime Right, which I can of course write as right. From just a algebraic point of view, I have done nothing, right. All I did was inserted the identity and then just pulled out that scalar and put it out here, right. Everything, everything okay. Now I am going to make an assertion and then just essentially prove the assertion and we are done, right. So another couple of lines of algebra. So the assertion is the following. I am going to assert that this is equal to sum over m prime. So I have removed the L sum, right, times some quantity which I will label as DL m m prime related to these vectors uh, this unit vector n and the rotation angle phi acting on l m prime right. You see what that d is what that d is basically it is the it is essentially trying to capture the rotations. You have an l quantum number corresponding it corresponding to it you have an m quantum number going from minus l to plus l right and now what you are doing is you are making a general rotation you are changing the lz eigenvalue right and you are putting it into some kind of superposition and the question is what, how do you evaluate these these coefficients of the superposition because if you know how to evaluate this coefficients of the superposition if i can do it for this state i can do it for any general state because any quantum state that i can write uh, for a uh, for the rigid rotor for instance is just going to be linear combinations of states that look like l comma m right so, I can always do a basis expansion in the L m basis and then there is just some coefficients that will come out front. But the general the kind of the real problem is basically inside this you just have this L m vector sitting and you want to know how to rotate it right. Do you understand the crux of the problem? Yeah. So, all I am saying is I am saying 
if I want to conserve energy, right? So if I'm in a given L sector, I can write a general quantum state, right? Um, unfortunate. Uh, okay. Let me say a general quantum state for the rigid rotor. With a given L quantum number, I can still write it as sum over M times CM LM, right? And the M has some allowed values, so minus 1, you know, minus L to plus L through 0, right? So this is a general, completely general quantum state with a given value of L. Now, if I basically want to apply to this, the rotation operator E to the I L dot N times phi divided by H bar, right? Then really what I have to do is apply this, you know, M going from minus L to plus L, CM times E to the I L dot N phi acting on LM. So if I, if I teach you how to do this, which is exactly what this psi is, I have taught you everything. Come again. I will show you how to evaluate D. I, oh, sorry, I haven't written it clearly. Okay. It has three indices. It has the index L, right? Which is kind of a conserved quantity. And it has this basically M M prime index. So I rotate from from uh, eigenvalue M to eigenvalue M prime, right? With some with some probability, right? Um, and then this rotation, this amplitude depends basically on the unit vector, which means the direction by along which I'm making the rotation. And it depends also um, by the amount of rotation I'm making, right? These two cannot disappear. The direction has to be important, and the amount of rotation, you know, the angle by 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 which you're rotating has to also be important, right? Yeah. Oh, m prime goes over uh, over the allowed values of L. So. Right? Because that's all it can be. See, if I take, if I take basically, uh, let's say like a five level atom, right? So I go from, uh, you know, uh, what is it, uh, minus, right? So you have the allowed values of L is minus L to plus L, right? So if, so there are two L plus one of these, right? If that is equal to five, right? Then L is 5 minus 1 divided by 2, right? Which is 2, right? So minus 2 minus 1, 0 plus 1 plus 2, right? D is a D is a number. Once I tell you M, M prime L for a given value of M5, that's just a number, right? But you can interpret the entire object as an operator in the M, M prime space. L prime, so I'm telling you what, what happens. Because I'm taking a given L, only that L will survive. It's orthogonality. In another second, it will become obvious to you. Even though you've summed over the full basis, you have to write formally on equation one. You have to fo formally write over all L L prime, L prime M prime. But then you basically just realize that look, actually the only thing that a rotation matrix in the angular momentum space, right, a rotation matrix can do is change the M quantum number and not the L quantum number because L square commutes with L, you know, with rotations. So it can't change the L quantum number, which means even though if I sum over all L's, the orthogonality will just get rid of all of them. And the only thing that will survive is basically the M summation. That's all. It depends on what's the initial state that you give. I am considering the following specific problem. Consider a state L comma M, right? And I'm telling you how to embed this into a different into a different problem that you have, which is, you know, which is I have a general quantum state side. Then just do a basis expansion. For hydrogen atom as well, you will do the same thing, right? For a given energy sector, you just write it as, you know, some CLM times LM. And then each of these Ls, you essentially have to, right? You'll have a rotation that be, that depend, that is pinned by the L value, right? Because for rigid rotor, basically, you don't have the uh, L degeneracy, but you have the M degeneracy. Then I can just focus on the M so that you can get the basic point of the physics without this additional confusion that the L can also change, right? 
without changing the energy which is what's the 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 big thing in the hydrogen atom right okay is that clear to everyone so essentially all i'm going to do is is just take 2 minutes to calculate the d and then you know and then we are we're done right so there is a lot more here huh? the wigner d matrix uh, there's entire books on on this thing so but i think this is part of uh, this will really just be the beginning of your next course should be a bit of the discussion on your next course. So the reason that I'm, I'm doing this is basically uh, because you know we have all of the algebra to do it. We just we can just do it right now, and you can just see it for what it is. But also because uh, this allows me the freedom or the flexibility to essentially do um, to discuss one or two more advanced topics if I want to. So this is the definition. So I want you to understand that this equation. Um, this equation is the definition of the Wigner D matrix, right? Now, so I am going to make an even bigger claim which is that the Wigner D matrix can be written indeed as e to the minus i times right so this should look very mysterious to all of you because <laughs> on the on the left hand side there is symbols l m and m prime right on the right hand and and there is n and phi on the right hand side the n and phi have disappeared and they've been replaced with some other symbols which is alpha beta and gamma right so this should this should seem slightly strange to you except for whenever you see alpha beta gamma and you're discussing rotations make a guess as to what's happening DCs are good are good guesses. Make another guess. Starts with E, ends with Euler angles. Okay, good. So, <laughs> right. so essentially, what what these are will they'll just become Euler angle Euler angles, right? And so, typically, this is typically called the Wigner big D, and this is called the Wigner small D, right? So, doesn't matter. So the proof is the following, right? The proof is simply that what you have to calculate dl m m prime of n comma phi, which I can write again as l m e to the i l dot n phi over h bar l m, right? I'm just directly just removing the L degeneracy, right? Because we don't need it. Uh, the the uh, the the uh, L L prime, right? I'm just directly just removing it and just writing it, right? And I, I could have made the argument already. Uh, here I could have just written over the L uh, over summed over just the M quantum numbers, right? So I should have probably even done that. Uh, so I'm just going to write this as L M prime L M. Um, but of course, this quantity can always be written as e to the minus i alpha lz over h bar e to the minus i beta ly over h bar e to the minus i gamma lz over h bar right so you see how the euler angle representation proves to be very very powerful because you have the lz quantum number sitting around which means you can immediately throw out two of them right you just evaluate two of them right and you see that's it that's the entire proof all i'm going to do is just write it down right so what that means is you can write this as l m prime e to the minus i alpha l z over h bar and i'm going to act it this way e to the minus i beta l y 
over h power e to the minus i gamma l z over h power l m and I'm going to act it that way, right? So that right hand side produces gamma m, right? Because what is lz going to measure? m h bar. Okay, <laughs> okay, I'll just do this. This quantity, because lz is an eigenvalue, is an, uh, m is an eigenvector of lz, right? Remember what it always does, it simply reproduces, right, the eigenvalue. So what you get is you can replace this with e to the minus i gamma m h bar over h bar. That's what you get times lm, right? Yes, just give me a second and which I can just basically just pull out this, this quantity and I can write it as lm times e to the minus i gamma m, right? And that's, uh, so plus i gamma m, right? And that's that quantity. Uh, let me just check the way I've written it, minus minus plus i gamma m, which means that I've had plus signs on all of these, right? So plus sign, plus sign. Okay, so you want me to explain going from here to here? That is just Euler angle representation. There is a whole proof of it in, uh, in classical mechanics, which I just assumed, sorry. Do you not know this? Ah, okay. Uh, I can do a dirty proof of it, but uh, I, uh, you know, so, okay. So, sorry, this should have been, did you not do rigid rotations? You did it. Oh, okay, fine. Okay, maybe you did it without. That's perfectly fair. Um, okay. So, he, let me say this in, in a, in a high level math way that I think you will, you will get, right? Um, how many, how many operators are there in, as I'm not pointing at anyone, how many operators are there in SO3? If I want to do three-dimensional rotations, let me actually ask it much simpler. If I want to do three-dimensional rotations, how many angles are there? Or how many operators are there? Three. Agree? You need three operators. Now, what that means is that when you exponentiate a three, so you have three operators, they have to be at least three-dimensional. So you have a three by three matrix. So this quantity, right, let's do three-dimensional rotations. This quantity, basically e to the L dot N times phi divided, it's just some 3 by 3 matrix. How many independent numbers can it have? Right? There's, there's three operators, Lx, Ly, Lz. Each of them you can attach to a number. Right? Theta x, theta y, theta z. Right? And then there's just some number phi which tells you by how much you're rotating. Right? So there are three independent, there's four independent numbers, but if you fix this special, which basically means that this thing has a, has determinant plus one, right? If you fix some something about the matrix, then there are three numbers. So I could either choose to write this vector, which is a unit vector, so it has only two parameters, right? So look at what this is. This is a two-dimensional unit vector, which means there are two parameters, and this is a one-parameter family. And so the total is three parameters. I could either choose to write it in a complicated fashion as e to the i l dot n phi divided by h bar, or I can choose to write it as e to the alpha l z e to the beta l y. If I wrote e to the gamma l x, would it be, would everyone be happy? Would you be happy? No? You shouldn't, but uh, uh, you know, because people typically, they, they're upset because they say, I want to see my three matrices, L, X, L, Y, L, Z. I want to see all three of them. Ek gaya like where did one of them go, right? That's not the point. The point is, if you take the commutator of these two numbers, these two operations, so expand this out. You have all of the tools to do this, by the way. Baker Campbell Hausdorff, like, you know, operator, um, exponentials of operators, you know, all of this stuff. So just expand this out. So this is one, one minus i gamma l z divided by h bar. This is one minus i beta l y divided by h bar. So when you take, when you start multiplying these operators together, you'll get commutators of l y l z. That produces the l x, right? So I don't need to separately write an l x operator over there. All I need to do is make an answer. So make a representation of the solution. And the representation of the solution should have the correct number, right? 
and you are guaranteed to at least cover you know you know well if I was loose I would say you are guaranteed to cover all solutions but you are guaranteed to cover all solutions up to some small thing up to rearrangements of these matrices. So you might have to kind of rearrange the matrices in some to get some matrix that I do not give you right. But uh, for three dimensional rotations there is a there is a straightforward proof. So let me just delegate the proof um, to something that is offline. So this is basically what is called the Euler angle representation. Right. Now let us play this game fearlessly right. So let us just play this game. Let me say I want you to do four dimensional rotations. It is SO4. How many angles does it have? How many operators does it have? 6 right n into n minus 1 divided by 2. So how many angles will it have? 6. So I can write an Euler angle representation for six dimensional rotation, four dimensional rotations, right? Ang munke, and it will just have six angles in it, right? And you don't need to invoke all six operators. I don't know how many you have to invoke. I've never tried to do this, but right? But you just have to check that the non-commutativity produces the full algebra, right? So that's the right? okay. So um, so let me just is a, that's a non-answer, right? Instead of telling you the proof of Euler angle representation, which I don't remember off the top of my head, I told you an algebraic trick to to, uh, to understand the theorem without ever telling you the proof of the theorem. Right? So cheating, lying by omission, right? Uh. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. That is ex identically what I say. You should be mystified by this. I'm sorry. So this thing, I just assumed that this was done in your classical mechanics course by this point in in, in the thing. Uh, so it's a, it's just a choice. It's a choice that uh, that the the made to just leave it out. Um, but um, the point is that uh, uh, is that uh, it's quite a straightforward proof. It's a constructive proof that any rotation that you write as e to the i l dot n times phi divided by h bar can just be written directly as the product of these three matrices, right? And you can say it's in Goldstein. Goldstein has the entire proof. I read it out of Goldstein like some x number of years ago x is a large number right um, okay so you have you just have to believe me that this is true I, I was so excited because I've said the Euler angle rotations many times in class before haven't I right I think I always assumed that it would be covered okay this is something for me to note actually um, somebody remind me to note this down I have to I have to keep this in mind Okay, so I'm 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 sorry for the mysterious sounding theorem that I just you know pulled out of. You know. It's a little bit like the shows that we used to watch in the 90s, huh? like uh, you know there's always like a villain and then there is just one silver bullet that will get him, and the silver bullet in this case is the Euler angle <laughs> representation. I invoke it, and you know. Okay, so um, so I am just trying to match the answer that I gave here. So I can either leave the minus signs alone, right, which is which is my temptation, um, and then just put a plus sign there, and like, and and then what happens is that this e to the minus i gamma l z acting on a l z acting on m produces m h bar, so it just produces a minus i minus i gamma l, right, uh, minus i gamma m, right, which is minus i gamma m, and then this way it produces a plus i alpha m prime right so alpha m prime minus gamma m and then what is left so this is e to the i alpha m prime minus gamma m times l m prime e to the minus i beta l y over h bar l m right and that is what I have just called the small d. And the small d only depends on one angle beta, right? Remember, there is nothing uh, for you to be. I mean, it looks slightly unusual the entire thing, but there is nothing for you to be kind of concerned about. So, if I replace l y, right, with sigma y h bar sigma y over two, 
right. So, that is the angular momentum operator for spin half particles. What do you get? You just get e to the minus beta sigma y, beta over 2 sigma y, right. What is e to the minus beta over 2 sigma y? It is cos beta identity minus i sin beta times sigma y, right. So, what you get when you evaluate this and what is m, m prime and m, it is the full basis. So, it is 0, you know, it is up and down, right. It is 0 and 1. So, this entire thing basically will look like you are taking the expectation value of cos beta over 2 times the identity plus i sin beta over 2 times sigma y in the m m prime basis right. So, I can write it basically exactly in the same language by writing a half there right because if I have if L is equal to a half 2L plus 1 is 2 times half plus 1 right which is 2 and that is the two states that we have which is up and down right. So, the at an algebraic level this algebra completely covers even the spin half that we are discussing, but from a physical perspective I do not want you to be confused right. Angular momentum algebra that we are doing comes out of R cross P, which means there is a space and then there is a particle that has some momentum right. The intrinsic spin that you probably uh, you know have heard this phrase being used for the spin that is in that is in an electron that we that we typically refer to as a spin half particle right. The intrinsic spin the thing that is the subject of the Sternger Luck experiment is not the angular momentum right. It is the thing that is that is outside of all of this physics, but that obeys the same algebra right. You understand this you can have basically you know you can discuss for instance you know I always like to tell people this example that you can discuss the word friction right. We invented this word in a very specific setting which is you know balls rolling they are not you know they are not doing what we expect them to do from conservative systems and then we invent a word to kind of describe what is happening right. But the same word friction can actually is used in all kinds of situations where there is some dissipative term there is something that is pushing energy pulling energy away from the system right. And inside hydrodynamics inside quantum mechanics inside all kinds of things there is you know the, uh, there is something called quantum friction which is what I typically talk to people about right. Um, and so what happens is that uh, wh what that means is that you can have a word that carries some commonality right which is referring to some common features between two things, but still the underlying things can be very different from each other they can share some of the commonality, but be very different from each other right. So, you, you would not expect something that is a fluid mechanics uh, usage of the word friction to be the same as let us say sociologists using friction or you know people in the social sciences using friction to describe you know disagreements between two people right. I mean these have the same connotation, but they are completely different beasts. So, for us it is a bit more confusing because of just the similarities the algebra is the same, but the underlying thing that produces the algebra is very different. Right. So, the electron as far as anyone has ever tried to measure it does not possess sp spatial extent and what that means is that the spin is truly intrinsic it is nothing to do with space right the spatial coordinate right ok. So, having warned you sufficiently um, I can evaluate this quantity right all I have to do is just take. So, what is this what is this object for every value of m and m prime it is a number, but how many values of m and m prime are there m can go from can be 0 or 1 minus half or half right, however you want to say it. in this language I would say minus half and half right and uh, and m prime can be minus half and half which means there are four values right and so it is a 2 by 2 matrix and if you write out the 2 by 2 matrix what do you get it basically just looks like cos beta over 2 minus sin beta over 2 sin beta over 2 and cos beta over 2. right that is all it will look like remember why because if m m prime is equal to m which means minus half let us say sigma y will take you sigma x takes you from minus half to plus half right 
So sigma y takes you from minus half to plus half of the phase, right? Which means if this is m prime was not equal to m, then only the sign will switch on. And if m prime is equal to m, then only the cos will switch on, right? You can just work this out, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Yes, I'm doing this in 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 air. I'm writing e to the i minus i beta l y over h bar for the case where l y is the spin half. Uh, angular momentum operator which is h bar over 2 times sigma y in which case this is e to the minus beta sigma y over 2 and that object you can because you know how to do how to expand operators you can write this as uh, as this object right is that clear just a warning uh, because we live in the internet age um, if you Google angular momentum algebra, you will run into basically orbital angular momentum of light, right? If you want to Google, if you're the kind of person that likes to write things down, please, please write this down. Because the orbital angular momentum of light shares this algebra, but is somewhat different. There is two parts of the angular momentum of light, one of which is this object, and there is another one which is an intrinsic angular momentum that also obeys the same algebra, right? That has lots of the similarities. So there is two or three slightly confusing things that you will encounter if you try and Google this information. And I just want to forewarn you so that you can look out for it, right? Um, and so if you look, if you stick to anything standard, if you're just looking up, you know, how to do some problems or something, this is okay. But if you want to read about stuff, then you should just be a bit warned that there's something, there's something else. Which matrix? This matrix? Oh, okay, sorry. Okay, I'll, let's just do this, it's fine. So all I was saying was the following. I was saying the D, the small d matrix, DL, M, M prime, right, of beta is defined as basically L, M, uh, M prime, E to the minus I beta L, Z over H bar times L, M, right? So I take an example. Lz is h bar over 2 times sigma y, uh, sorry, ly, ly. Nobody is correcting me, right, ly, right, ly. So, uh, so I, ch I choose the spin half algebra, so this is L sigma y, and so this quantity is technically defined as L comma m prime e to the minus i beta h bar sigma y over 2 h bar times l m which is l m prime e to the minus beta over 2 sigma y minus i beta over 2 sigma y l m right now we can evaluate what this e to the minus beta over 2 is minus i. So this is identity operator minus i beta sigma y over 2 minus i beta over 2 squared uh, 1 over 2 factorial times sigma y squared so on and so forth. Right? Like we have done several times before you can verify that this object you can just look at the first two terms and write the answer down is cosine beta over 2 minus i sine beta over 2 times sigma y. Right? Which is what I wrote here. Right? Uh, I put a plus sign because I forgot. Right? So this should be a minus sign. Right? Is that good? And now we have to evaluate this quantity. So the question that we are asking with D L M M prime of beta is we are asking let us say L is half, we have declared that already, M prime cosine beta over 2 times the identity matrix minus I 
sin beta over 2 times sigma y times half m, right. So, what is sigma y? 0 minus i, i 0, right. So, sigma y acting on 0 1 is minus i 0, which is minus i times 1 0, right. So, up to a number, right, up to a phase, this minus i, this thing just produces 0 goes to 1, right. Uh, we can write the phase as well. Oh, did I forget the phase? Okay, let me just evaluate this fully, right. So, um, right, so minus half is the lower one. So, sigma y acting on minus half produces minus i times plus half and you can verify that sigma y times plus half produces plus i times minus half, right. And then you can just evaluate. So, this you can write d L essentially as a matrix, right. L is in fact a half, right. You can write d half as a matrix and the matrix carries the value, the, the numbers, you know, let us say 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 and 1, 1, right in the four corners, right. What happens when m, uh, uh, I am switching notation, sorry, um, half, half, minus half, minus half minus half plus half, plus half minus half and uh, plus half plus half, right, something like that. And what happens when you go, when you set m prime to plus half and uh, m to plus half or m prime to minus half and m to plus minus half, right. The sigma y transition basically produces for you 0, do you see that, okay. So, cos beta over 2 times the identity minus i sin beta over 2 times sigma y acting on minus half is cos beta over 2 times the identity times minus half minus i sin beta over 2 times plus half, right. And then when I go from minus half to plus half, what do I put? Minus i or plus i? Minus i. So, minus i times minus i is just minus sin beta over 2, right. Now, I am asking what is, I had minus half here. So, what is the minus half expectation value with cos beta over 2 identity minus i sin beta over 2 sigma y times minus half and this quantity is basically cos beta over 2 minus half minus half minus sin beta over 2 minus half plus half and that is 0. So, only the diagonal term survives and so if you did minus half minus half you would put cos beta over 2 here and if you just do the analysis you would put minus sin beta over 2 here minus sin beta over 2 here and cos beta over 2 here which is exactly that way, right, good. Uh, let me make one more um, example, but let me leave it as an exercise for you. So, you can also choose example 2, you can choose L y to be half O y, right, O y is the spin 1 operator, right. So, I am choosing L equals 1, right. What is the fundamental dimensionality of this matrix? 3 by 3, right, has to be a 3 by 3 matrix. So, what you can verify by essentially using two things, right. Thing number 1 or point, point number 1 is that L y is L plus minus L minus divided by 2 y. Uh, right, yeah, that is correct, right. And uh, thingy number 2 is that L plus acting on 0, 0, 1 should produce 0, 1, 0 and L plus square acting on 0, 0, 1 should produce 1, 0, 0 and L plus cube should die, right. By just using these bits of information, 
you should be able to establish what L y is and I will write the answer down L y is h power over square root 2 0 minus i 0 i 0 minus i 0 i 0 right and once you do that you can again compute basically the exponential of this operator blah 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 off you go right. So that is um, that is the, the little module right. Uh, so from next class onwards I will do the hydrogen atom. So that is the little module that basically took us um, from our understanding of the central force problem right by separating the, the, so remember what we did, we took the central force problem, we separated the variables, the radial part from the angular part, we solved the radial part, looked at you know one or two examples of the radial equation, right, and um, the angular equation we had not considered, we just put it aside basically just to kind of come back to it, and once we solved two examples which I wanted to show you, right, the infinite spherical well and then the, uh, the rigid rotor, right. We brought back basically these uh, uh, these L M right, so the spherical part, uh, the the angular part of the uh, of the central force problem, and we asked ourselves, what is this object actually? What is it doing? What are the symmetries of it? Why does it have the structure that it has, right? And we've had a deep understanding of it, hopefully, right, by now. What uh, we've also done, just as a technicality, is we've actually computed something that is very very important in atomic physics and uh, molecular physics and all those things, right? So you should be able to ca calculate transition probabilities. This will this will basically be your bread and butter if you're going to do the do that stuff. And what we've done is basically set ourselves up to do that by being able to evaluate the Wigner D matrices, right? So from next class, what I'll do is I'll basically just move on um, directly to the hydrogen atom. And um, what we will do is we will basically point out the hydrogen atoms. Uh, we'll take the radial part of the wave function. We will point out what the solution of the radial uh, part of the wave function is. The angular is already done again. And the radial basically has an extra symmetry sitting inside it, which is related to this L degeneracy, the Laplace Rangel lens vector. And I will construct the Laplace Rangel lens vector, show you that it is actually that that degeneracy makes sense. We will try and understand it from the classical and the quantum point of view, right? And so you will have, and I will write down the energy levels, the you know, the Balmer, the passion, the fund, blah, 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 the usual spectroscopic stuff that you have seen in undergrad and then we will proceed from there, right. And so what I want to do, so that will be uh, Thursday and then on Friday hopefully what we will do is we will do um, uh, addition of angular momentum, I think addition of angular momentum, I am not quite sure actually, uh, maybe one or two more things about the hydrogen atom and then we will, I will try and also do addition of angular momentum before we go, right.